began then with the briefing. We'll start with the COVID briefing so that Dr. Uh, Escott uh, and Director Hayden can uh, get over to the county uh, where they go to when they leave us. Uh, manager, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, this is our standing briefing on COVID-related activities. And I'll just note uh, before I hand it over to Dr. Director Hayden and Dr. Escott, that since we last met, uh, we did uh, mark a milestone in this endeavor, and that was uh, six months since uh, we declared the local disaster and six months since we had our first COVID uh, test come back positive for our community. Uh, as you can imagine, during that time, we've seen incredible uh, work from our professional staff and from our community to make sure that we are containing the spread of this uh, disease. Uh, we are so thankful and appreciative of everyone that's working on it, the collaborations that we have with our partners, uh, and we just need to continue that message of, of keep at it. Uh, we cannot let up and not uh, lose our good standing and ensuring that we're taking the precautions necessary uh, to combat this virus. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Director Hayden. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Spencer. Um, I agree with Spencer. Um, we have hit the six month milestone where we received the information about our first positive case. Um, and, you know, Austin Public Health started doing work in, in January um, where we were doing um, surveillance and um, working with the airport about individuals that may be coming back in from mainland China. And so um, I would like to applaud. Austin Public Health staff um, because the passion that the staff have in this space is just so amazing. Um, I have a, a really good team, um, individuals that, you know, really have, you know, decades of experience in working in infectious disease and, you know, other ones that, you know, may be relatively new to the city but have really stepped up. Um, you know, we have a, a really good team, so I, I would like to publicly um, acknowledge them. But I would also, you know, like to thank all of our uh, partners across the city and other departments, um, as well as our partners in the community and um, city management, as well as our elected officials. Um, in a lot of cities across the nation, um, as I have conversations with my colleagues across the state of Texas, as well as the nation, um, I think I'm one of the more fortunate ones that has the support that I have throughout the city um, as a department. And so we are really blessed. So I just want to thank everyone for the support. Um, Austin Public Health, just as a reminder, we have an interlocal um, agreement with the UT Dale Medical School, and we have an agreement with Community Care to assist us with our COVID work. And that does include the um, testing and contact tracing. Um, each of them, um, we have the data for their positive cases, as well as um, information about where they are um, doing contact tracing. However, each of them um, have data that they share on their um, websites, which provides a, um, a daily or a weekly update of the testing that happens for them in the cases that they are working on. And so that has been a really great partnership. Um, our staff continue to um, work with those teams. And so our EPI team has a daily meeting with um, a staff person from Community Care and UT Dale Med. And then on Fridays, we have a um, special meeting, which is um, specifically contact tracing. We continue to have our priorities in that area, making sure that um, we have staff that are bilingual, um, that are working um, doing contact tracing, as well as our nurse line um, to provide assistance. And we continue to do this work through an equity lens. With our walk-up sites, we continue to have our Dove Springs, our um, Givens and Walnut Creek communities, and our drive-up site um, testing a community at St. John's community, at the St. John's Center, not Center, I'm sorry, at the St. John location. 
Um, each of those locations are locations that have um, high positivity in those communities. We are adding um, another site next week. We will be adding the Metropolis Neighborhood Center on um, September 22nd. This is the um, older Montopolis Neighborhood Center, and we will be providing um, testing in that community three days a week. Um, so that pretty much rounds all of the areas. At those testing sites, um, just as a reminder, individuals can go to the website and register, or they can call our nurse line to register for appointments at either one of those locations. Um, as well as the at-home testing. We continue to do that testing at home. Um, we are, with our long-term care um, incident management, we are so excited to report that the nursing home data is, um, the dashboard is now active. Um, and so you can go onto that site and look at our, um, our um, data for the um, long nursing home sites and long-term care sites, as well as look at the year-to-day testing, strike team support, and PPE. So we're really excited about that. Um, there continues to be a decrease um, for testing um, PPE and strike teams in that area. Um, we have um, been notified that um, Health and Human Services, um, as a part of their phase one uh, facility designation, they have issued new rules which require ongoing testing of staff at nursing facilities um, at a frequency that is determined by the county's positivity rate. So therefore, there must be additional testing um, at these facilities. Now, some of the individuals have reached out, others have um, moved forward and put systems in place and so they are able to provide that testing to their staff at those facilities. With the homeless update, um, with our food access, the Eating Apart Together Eat initiative has provided over 450,000 meals to people experiencing homelessness. And so um, this is a contract that we've had with Revelation Foods as well as um, Central Texas Food Bank and Cisco to be able to provide this food. In addition, um, the department has worked um, very closely with animal services um, to assist um, homeless folks that have, um, have pets. And so um, within this initiative, we've been able to provide um, dog food for pets as well. Our um, staff have continued to uh, provide those reports through that system. Our um, hygiene services, we have eight sites in the city that provide access to showers and toilet and hand washing stations. And um, just a reminder, that is on the website and you can see that there. With our, um, our education and training, um, Austin Public Health in partnership with ECHO Community Care and Dell Med, is providing ongoing education and information to homeless shelter and outreach staff through the community. Um, we provided um, a, a training seminar on, on the 7th of this month. With our um, protective lodges, the department met with FEMA to address concerns um, that the protective lodges are being perceived as an emergency shelter. These are not emergency shelters, and that is not how the city is using them. These services are designed for high-risk individuals that meet the CDC guidelines. And so we are available um, to meet with you individually to discuss if you have any concerns about the meeting with FEMA. The social services branch, we're continuing with our Partnership with um, Central Health Community Care in Travis County, Protect Yourself and Protect Your Family campaign um, with our um, PPE distribution. Um, you can go to our website and see our sites. Um, this week, um, we do, we will be at um, tomorrow at the, we will be today at the Mexican Consulate. We'll be at um, Ruiz Library 
and George Morales Dub Springs providing um, PPE. In addition to um, that PPE, when individuals come through all of our testing sites, we provide them PPE as well as information about um, services that they can access if they need to. As a reminder, our RISE 2.0 applications opened yesterday um, and will be open through September 21st at 7 p.m. And that information is on the website. Our um, child care and schools are continuing to provide um, targeted outreach to child care centers in five focus zip codes to provide additional technical assistance on preventing the spread of COVID. Our epidemiology and IT teams are finalizing an online reporting form for schools to complete on a weekly basis. We yet continue to receive that information um, through our normal process. We have added additional nurses to assist with the calls that we are starting to receive through those um, lines as well. We have um, a um, website, as you know, so you could send information to us at aphschoolinfo at austintexas.gov if you have any questions or concerns at the school level. We are continuing to do additional outreach and education and enforcement at um, several of our facilities, including businesses and restaurants. That concludes my report, and I will transition over to Dr. Escott. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, if I could ask AV to pull up my slides. And I just want to echo uh, Spencer and, and Stephanie's sentiments. Uh, regarding the last six months, we really do have an incredible team and, and are certainly blessed to have so many people who are passionate about their jobs. Uh, Austin is uh, in, in great hands. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, Mayor and Council, uh, again, uh, updates regarding our uh, COVID-19 situation in, in uh, the city in Travis County. Uh, this is a graph of our new confirmed cases with the yellow being the seven-day moving average. Yesterday, we reported 75 new cases, uh, which places our moving average at 105. Uh, you can see from the graph that since September 3rd, uh, we have been on the increase. Uh, September 3rd, we had a moving average of uh, 69 to 70. And again, now we're at 105. Um, so we are no longer plateaued, no longer decreasing, but uh, increasing uh, over the past 11 days. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a graph of the new admissions uh, that, that you're used to seeing. Uh, our uh, admissions yesterday was 11, which places our moving average at 14.9. Uh, this has been uh, plateaued for a little while, but uh, thankfully now decreasing again. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about why we're seeing increasing cases but continue to see uh, some decrease in admissions, or at least one, one theory about why we're seeing that. Uh, but again, uh, our, our primary indicator in the past has been uh, new admissions in relation to our, our community risk and staging. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's good that we continue to see that drop. Our hospitals are in a, a great situation, plenty of ICU beds and hospital beds and ventilators. Uh, so once again, if, if folks have been putting off care, uh, physicals, certainly immunizations, uh, please go get those things taken care of. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a graph of our uh, hospitalizations in blue. In orange is the ICU beds being utilized in gray ventilators. Uh, again, our hospital capacity has, uh, has been uh, improving. Uh, we reported a total of 93 hospitalizations yesterday, uh, which has flattened out a little bit in the past several days. Uh, we've got a moving average of 97.7. Uh, ICU, uh, we reported yesterday 34 ICU beds being utilized with a moving average of 37.4. And we've got 18, IC, uh, 18 ventilators being utilized with a moving average of 22.9. Again, those two measures uh, continue that, that slow decline. Next slide, please. 
This is an update of our hospitalizations in the five county MSA by race and ethnicity. Uh, the green uh, is a line that we've been focusing on for some time, which is our Latinx, so those who've identified as Hispanic uh, during their admission to the hospital. Uh, last week, we reported 43.3% uh, of the admissions were in that group. This week, it's 43.8%, a slight increase, but relatively flat. Uh, similarly, our African-American uh, population in gray, which is the third line from the top, uh, is 12.5% uh, of admissions this week and 12.5% of admissions last week. Uh, we did have a significant increase, uh, if you see in the, uh, towards the bottom, the orange, which is our Asian American uh, uh, population hospitalized, an increase from 0.8% to 4.2% of the uh, in total individuals being hospitalized uh, in the past seven days. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a graph of our uh, hospitalizations by age group. Uh, we have seen a decrease in our, our older age group, the 70 to 79 and, and 80 plus, uh, which we're thankful for. I will point out the gray line uh, third from the bottom, which is our 10 to 19 age group, uh, which uh, is 5.8% of the hospitalizations this week, 6.1% last week. Uh, that re represents six individuals uh, in that age group that were hospitalized in the last seven days. Uh, and uh, I'll talk more about that particular age group here in a moment. Next slide, please. Uh, so this graph is showing the uh, total positivity by week. Again, this is a uh, collaborative effort from a number of different testing entities uh, with more than 275,000 test results entered into this database. Uh, last week, I reported week 34 and week 35. Uh, if you recall, uh, week 35 uh, was reported at 4.6%. Uh, that has increased slightly to 4.7% with additional test results coming in. Uh, week 36, which is the new week, uh, is 4.8%. Uh, uh, so relatively flat. Again, week 33 uh, and 34, flat at 6.1. Week 35, week 36, relatively flat. 4.7 to 4.8. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a breakdown of positivity by race and ethnicity. Again, the, uh, the red dotted line is that 5% mark that we'd like to get everybody under. Uh, I'm showing you here week 34 through week 37. Uh, you can see that uh, the, the gray line, our Hispanic or, or Latinx community, uh, has had a progressive decrease. Uh, that decrease is slowing down. Uh, that was about 9.3 percent for week 37 and week 36, both. Uh, again, we want to push that below that 5 percent line. Uh, in the gold color is our uh, African American population, uh, which is under 5 percent at this stage. Uh, again, uh, we're continuing the same efforts as Director Hayden mentioned, uh, targeted uh, focused efforts in, in communities of high positivity, uh, which also tend to be communities, uh, communities of color. Uh, so it's, we're hopeful that these ongoing efforts, uh, these efforts by our partners uh, at Community Care, as well as our community partners uh, from the nonprofit agencies, uh, will continue to push these uh, positive rates down. Next slide, please. Mayor and Council, this is a, uh, a graph of the positivity by age group. Uh, the gold bar is representing the 10 to 19 year old age group. Uh, and you can see, unlike the other age groups, which are generally decreasing in positivity, that age group is increasing each week in positivity uh, with a significantly higher uh, rate of positivity as compared to every other group. Uh, most groups are, are in the 5% range or less. Uh, the, uh, the 10 to 19 age group is, is significantly higher than that. Uh, so in the neighborhood of uh, 12 to 14% uh, over the past two weeks. Um, so again, as we see younger people getting infections, our case numbers are going to increase but because of the risk of hospitalization, 
being so much less, dramatically less, in those age groups as compared to older adults, we can see that increase in cases, but we will not expect to see an increase in hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and ventilator use. Uh, but we have to make sure that that disease do not, does not spread beyond those age groups. Uh, and that's where it's important for our, our school students, particularly our high school and college students, uh, to be really focused on, on those efforts at, at social distancing and personal hygiene. Uh, it is even more important when they're around adults. Uh, to give you some, some perspective, and, and we are working on uh, some additional data that, that can be shared publicly related to, to rates within that 10 to 19 age group. But I'll give you the numbers now uh, because you know, I think a lot of people are thinking uh, this is all college students. And, and the college students are playing a significant role in, uh, in the positivity in that 10 to 19 age group as well as the 20 to 29 age group. Uh, and uh, UT has done a great job of uh, sharing their information publicly on a COVID-19 dashboard. But when we look at the data that we have in hand, our uh, positivity rate for our college students last week, week 37, uh, or week 36, was 9.4%. Uh, that's out of 235 individuals tested. Um, our high school students, however, are 14% positive, uh, but much less uh, of them were tested, 107. Middle, middle school students, 5.6%, 36 tested, and elementary school students, 1.5%, with 48 tested. Uh, and those are tested that we have results for. Uh, again, because it was last week, there are still going to be some results that are going to roll into us. Uh, but right now, our highest transmission within that 10 to 19 age group, high school students number one, college students number two. Uh, but again, uh, we're asking those young people to uh, uh, take responsibility, to be leaders, uh, to advocate for, for safety, and in particular, avoiding large gatherings where we know that these, uh, these diseases are transmitted. Next slide, please. Uh, Mayor and Council, this is just an overlay. I, I showed this to you several weeks ago. Uh, this is updated with, with three measures. The blue is the new cases per 100,000 population in Travis County. Uh, the orange is the seven-day moving average of new admissions. And the gray dots are the percent positivity overlaid on the same timeline. I've indicated uh, with a red arrow approximately when the governor issued uh, the statewide mandate uh, if you recall, in the weeks leading up to that, uh, there was significant advocacy from uh, from the mayor and his council, uh, as well as uh, as uh, public health entities around the state of Texas, regarding the importance of of masking and, and requesting that mandate. Uh, we can see that uh, very shortly after that, that dis those discussions increased and that mandate was was created. Uh, that we had a significant decline in in cases. Uh, in, in terms of positivity, as well as uh, new cases and hospitalizations. Uh, I do want to point out also, if you look towards the right of that screen, you can see our positivity numbers in gray uh, plateau off for two weeks, uh, drop down and plateau off again for two weeks. Uh, that's 6.1% uh, for two weeks and then 4.7, 4.8% for two weeks. Uh, if we follow the same pattern that we see in hospitalizations, uh, we can expect that we'll see a decline and then a plateau again, uh, as we saw uh, it over the past couple of weeks uh, uh, prior to the onset of uh, last week. Uh, so again, we're still watching these numbers, uh, still determining if uh, how predictive this uh, positivity rate is in terms of the impact on hospitalizations and we'll continue to provide updates on this graph. Doctor, while you have that graph up, just to, to be clear, because this has come up in discussions, uh, when somebody implements a new policy, we would expect to see an impact in admissions about three weeks later, about 21 days. So sure. what this chart shows us is that the, the, the initial arresting of the peak as it was going up was not the governor's action, it was the action that cities across the state took 
prior to the governor's action. Certainly the governor's action much appreciated. The governor making it mandating certainly helps get that, that message. But I, I assure I'm appreciative of, of mayors and county judges across the state moving forward with that earlier uh, and, and kind of bringing the governor along uh, to, to, to make that change and to stop that peak from going up. Yeah, absolutely, Mayor. And uh, as you said, it's it's going to take at least uh, you know two or three weeks to, to really see the impact on hospitalizations. And that's why the uh, that increasing discussion, that increasing uh, dialogue uh, with the state and the federal government around the importance of masking, leading up to the governor's decision, is uh, uh, is likely responsible for the uh, in initial blunting of, of that peak. Um, but I, I do also want to reinforce the importance of, of unity of, of city, state, and federal government in terms of, of masking and social distancing. And I bring that up because we're going to see increased pressure to relax these restrictions, uh, these protective actions, as the situation continues to improve. Uh, the debate regarding the utility of masking will continue to rage on despite uh, evidence such as this, which you know, certainly correlates with, with a blunting effect and, uh, and a subsequent decrease in cases. Uh, this is the effect of the treatment. The treatment is masking and social distancing and, and hygiene practices. If we take away that treatment, the disease will return. Just like when we stop taking our blood pressure medicine or our seizure medicine or other kinds of medicines, uh, it's not gone. It's still around, and uh, and we need to continue to reinforce this unified message uh, at all levels of government so that the community is very clear on this issue. So thanks for bringing that up. Next slide, please. As Director Hayden said, uh, there's a new. Uh, COVID-19 long-term care facility dashboard. Uh, so if you go to the main austintexas.gov forward slash COVID-19 page, there's a button for dashboards, and this is on there. Uh, as you said, it, it shows a number of different measures. Uh, individuals can click on uh, facilities and, and find out uh, uh, the disease trends cases in, in terms of residents and staff cases, as well as an overall picture. Uh, so I'll encourage folks to utilize that site. Uh, I will not be providing uh, updates uh, during council session uh, with the nursing home uh, spreadsheet that, that I normally do because this is much better. Um, so we'll continue to, um, to, to point that to folks and, and that'll be updated on a regular basis so uh, folks can, can follow the trends. Next slide, please. Uh, Mayor Council, if you permit me, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about, about two things which uh, are consistently coming up in terms of questions. Number one is the airborne transmission of COVID-19 and, and what role it plays, and the other is, is COVID-19 convalescent plasma. Uh, we're going to call this Journal Club because that's, that's what we call it in, in, in medical school when we're talking about some research and, and, uh, and having a discussion about it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so as folks are, are, are familiar with, there's this ongoing discussion about airborne transmission in terms of COVID-19. Uh, and uh, a lot of this is based upon this study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The reference is, is there on the screen, uh, which showed that, that in a lab setting, a sample with intact virus when introduced via jet nebulizer, basically uh, shooting air through the liquid to create an aerosol can create an aerosol where virus intact can be sampled for up to three hours in this study. Um, it's three hours because that was the duration of the experiment. There's been some subsequent studies to indicate that it may be longer than that, up to 16 hours. Uh, but this is an experimental setting trying to create aerosol of the virus. Next slide, please. So there are a number of studies. Uh, there are six studies here which shows that 
when sampling is done in settings such as uh, a medical center, uh, uh, a patient's room uh, with COVID-19, you can detect viral RNA. Right? You can sample it, you take it to the PCR lab, and you can detect it. There's a significant difference between being able to detect a virus and that virus being able to transmit disease. Next slide, please. Uh, this is, uh, I think, eight additional studies which do air sampling in similar settings. Uh, this may be uh, bathrooms, it may be hospital rooms, it may be cruise ships with, with active transmission of disease. They did not find virus in air sampling that was capable of transmitting disease. Uh, so we have conflicting evidence. We, we have some information that we can create an aerosol in a laboratory setting which has intact virus. We've got a group of studies showing that you can detect some aspect of that viral RNA in this group of studies which says that you can't. Next slide, please. So where does that leave us? These are the take home points regarding airborne transmission. Uh, so it's been shown that it's, it's possible in a lab setting to aerosolize or nebulize COVID-19 enough, small enough particles to where it can stay suspended in the air for a duration of time. Um, when we look at settings, actual settings, patient rooms, cruise ships, et cetera, we don't have any evidence to show that there's virus there that is intact and in enough quantities to lead to significant transmission of disease. So the conclusion at this stage, uh, and this is not just Dr. Escott, this is the WHO and, and other entities, is that airborne transmission is a possible route of transmission, but it's unlikely to be a significant contributor to the spread of COVID-19. Uh, so the primary method is droplet. Uh, just like it's been all along. Uh, is it possible that, that, that it may be on smaller particles and travel a short distance, distance of time? It's possible. Uh, you know, we have to use caution in, in confined spaces, indoor spaces, uh, where there's lots of people and it's poorly ventilated and you're together for a long period of time. But outside of that setting, it's very unlikely that the airborne transmission is, is a significant factor. Uh, this is also reflected in the National Academy's publication regarding schools where they've, they've talked about the importance of air ventilation as something you, else you can do if you've, if you've done the other protective measures, but it's probably not the key to decreasing transmission. The physical distancing, uh, the hand hygiene, and the masking are the keys. Um, so again, there's a lot of concern. I know there's a lot of concern from, uh, from teachers and other workers regarding the possibility of airborne transmission. Uh, if folks wear their masks, if they keep their distance, if they're washing their hands, and, and certainly if they're staying home with their sick, uh, airborne transmission is unlikely to be a significant factor uh, in the spread of disease. Next slide, please. Uh, so convalescent plasma, we've certainly seen, seen a lot of debate on, on this issue also. Uh, so I've, I've done a pro-con on this as well. Uh, so our, you know, we've, we've been using it here in Austin and Travis County for, for months and months. Uh, we had one of the first blood banks that, uh, that packaged this and made it available for, uh, for use in the hospital. Uh, so this is a study which was pub published by uh, the Mayo Clinic and in this study, they had more than 35,000 patients, 53% were in the ICU, 27.5% of them on a ventilator. Uh, so two key findings uh, on this study. Uh, it's not a randomized control trial, but it's, it's a big study and, and there's a lot to learn. Number one, if a patient received that convalescent plasma in three days or less, they had a 37% lower seven-day mortality rate as compared to those who got it four days or after. So that's a relative risk reduction 
8.7% versus 11.9%. The same findings were true for 30-day mortality rate, uh, where that benefit was 24% uh, decrease uh, in mortality. Important finding number two is that there's a dose-response relationship uh, for both seven-day mortality and 30-day mortality, meaning progressively higher doses of convalescent plasma equate to progressively increasing protection or decreasing mortality risk. And again, uh, 8.9 for those who receive the highest doses uh, versus 13.7 for those who receive the lowest. Uh, in uh, a similar relationship with the 30-day mortality. When you take these things in combination, comparing those who receive high uh, antibody doses and in three days or less, they had a 20% rate of mortality over 30 days as compared to 30% in those who had the lowest uh, dose of, of uh, convalescent plasma that were after the uh, uh, four days or after. Uh, so again, significant changes in mortality based upon those things. Next slide, please. So some controversy was brought up with this study uh, in, uh, in the, the references is located on the screen there. Uh, so the goal of this study was uh, to be a randomized uh, trial to assess 60-day mortality of convalescent plasma versus standard care. Uh, they planned to enroll more than 400 patients. They enrolled 86, and they halted the study. Because what they found is, by the time the patients were randomized, the antibody titer that they had in their blood was similar to the antibody that they were going to be administered. And they felt that there was not much point and giving somebody who already has antibodies, antibodies of a, of a similar magnitude. But the patients were randomized at a median of 10 days since the onset of their symptoms. Uh, so again, this doesn't really tell us that much. Uh, there was obviously no mortality benefit and, and uh, uh, morbidity benefit because they didn't have enough power to, they didn't enroll the 400 and, and, and so forth patients. Uh, so this really doesn't tell us any much, and it's not uh, not enough for us to consider changing the practice of administering COVID-19 plasma to our patients here in Austin and Travis County. Next slide, please. Uh, so take-home points for this. The Mayo uh, Clinic study shows that the, the uh, convalescent plasma is promising. Earlier administration improves benefits, uh, it has an increased uh, yield in, in uh, mortality benefit. Progressively higher doses get progressively better uh, reductions in mortality. Uh, but we do need to still have randomized controlled trials. Uh, so the, the Mayo Clinic study is the initial study uh, to see if it's, it's got indicators of, of benefit. Then comes the randomized controlled trials to answer questions like, who are the patients who are most likely to benefit? What's the optimal timing of administration? And what's the optimal dosing of the convalescent plasma? These things still need to be done, but that does not mean we should put the brakes on, on convalescent plasma therapy, uh, including uh, encouraging donation, including storage of no supplies. Uh, so my recommendation is that we continue to, uh, to utilize that in the clinical practice uh, and then we increase our, our preparation of uh, being able to screen people, uh, being able to increase our collection and increase our storage of uh, COVID-19 convalescent plasma. Next slide, please. Uh, so finally, Mayor and Council, we're still at stage three. Again, to uh, get into stage two, we need to be less than 10 on that seven day moving average of admissions. Uh, and again, we'd like to be below 3% in terms of our positivity rate uh, across the community. Uh, we're going to have to dis uh, discuss changes in policy as we get to stage two, which we're working on. As Director Hayden said earlier in relation to our protective lodges, uh, those are meant to protect people during uh, significant community transmission of COVID-19. As we move to better stages of risk, 
and that transmission is controlled, then we may need to alter our, our policies associated with, with the protective lodges, uh, which may not be necessary in these lower stages of, uh, of, of risk in, in Travis County. Uh, with that, I will turn it back over to you, Mayor. Dr. Escott, thank you. And, and again, thank you to your staff and Director Hayden, uh, to, to yours. It's real encouraging to see the, the, the numbers go down the way that they have. Um, we have a couple of things that, that present possible risk factors to us that we haven't had a chance yet to work through our system. Uh, that would be uh, Labor Day, uh, whether we would see a new associated with that. It would be the, the UT football game, potentially students coming back. The 40,000 people, which is the estimate of the number of people who were fleeing the hurricane uh, that passed through our, our city. Uh, we haven't seen an increase in hospitalizations yet, but the, the, the case numbers seem going up a little bit, although it's, it's, it's weighted toward younger people that hopefully are not going to end up in hospitals, but are just as contagious for sending somebody else to the hospital uh, as anyone else. So. We see cases beginning to go up yet. Community needs to stay real cautious if we're going to be able to uh, drive the positivity rates down farther so we have a better chance of opening up and sustaining both schools and, and businesses. So I really appreciate that work. I also want to compliment you and Austin Public Health, Director Hayden, on managing to avoid outbreaks among uh, our population community experiencing homelessness and talking to my peers, mayors around the, the country, that has often a critical area of, of kind of failure in their system. So whatever it was that you guys were doing to, to prevent that from happening in, in our community uh, worked. Uh, so I'm just real appreciative that, that you did whatever it was that you did uh, to make sure that on top of the challenges we have had to deal with, like in nursing homes and, and the challenges we have in the, in the Hispanic uh, community, we haven't had that. Uh, you were able to identify and arrest and isolate early the, the clusters of breakouts we have. So, so thank you for that, for that work and, and work that you're doing. And I add my call to yours and to, uh, Director Hayden said to the city managers for people to stay diligent on this. That chart you have shows the impact of masking and why that's still a discussion anywhere in the country about whether masking helps or not is just beyond me. Uh, colleagues, uh, questions for um, uh, our public health folks. Councilmember Kitchen. Um, I just want to say um, thank you again for, uh, thank you both for getting the um, dashboard out uh, related to um, uh, long-term care facilities. That's, um, that's really uh, useful information and the way it's presented will be very helpful for people. So um, I, I just want to say, I know you all have uh, been working on it for a while and I consider that to be a major accomplishment and um, and I understand it'll be updated on a regular basis. So again, thank you very much. Um, it's very helpful for people to see uh, what's been happening and also down to the level of the individual facilities. So thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Colleagues, anything else before we go to the next briefing? Um, uh, Council Member Tovo and then Council Member Alter. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to just <laughs> Excuse me, briefly say thank you for the tremendous work. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about our food, our food programs. I was really pleased to see, um, well, let me just ask um, whether there's an update to the caregiver meals question of funding. I received word yesterday that there might be and just wanted to, to ask that question if anyone on the call has that information. I, I don't have an update um, in that space. I've not received any information about us having additional funding, so I'd have to check with the budget office again. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, and I wanted to talk just briefly about how we are funding, how we are supplying meals to ProLodges. 
Um, is there an opportunity there? It's my understanding that they've been primarily handled through large contracts. Um, and I wonder if we might regard those pro lodges as another opportunity to really have, have uh, some support for our local businesses so that it could be both a, a necessary basic needs um, program as well as an economic development one. And so to the extent that that's something that you've explored, I just wanted to speak, speak to you about that. I, I have had an opportunity to meet with some restaurants and, and all along they propose these kinds of conglomerations of local restaurants to help meet the need in our community for food at the same time, helping keep their employees on the payroll and you know helping keep their families fed. So is that a is that a model yes we can at the program? yes we can um yes we can follow up with you um about that and look at what we've done um you know with the school districts um that has been a very um beneficial model to our community so i can follow up with you and we can um kind of walk through that um, definitely would, you know, want to bring the purchasing folks to the table right. to be a part of that because, you know, they typically help us out um, with the kind of meal provision. I'm, I'm familiar. Yeah, thank you. And I look forward to that conversation and, and perhaps there'll be an opportunity to bring some of it into our conversation at the Economic Development Cabinet tomorrow. Um, I'm familiar with the way it's worked very successfully at, through, the school, through the school districts, through the caregiver meals. I'm not aware that it's being utilized widely. It may be utilized in one case with regard to the pro lodges, but I'm not, um, I see that as another opportunity to, to use this model of employing our local restaurants to help meet that need that we're supplying for food at those pro lodges. And so I welcome, I welcome that um, conversation, Director Hayden. I wondered if you could speak to us about whether UT, I know there's been conversation and and UT is doing a great job of getting information out to their students and getting information out to the public about the status of, of cases. I know we've all, um, well, Dr. Escott already, yeah, I think, addressed some of, some of the issues attendant with that. I wondered if you had any updates about whether UT is moving forward with providing um, isolation facilities on campus or whether students who are, are finding themselves in need of isolation are have as their option, as their main option, um, isolating at a city facility? Um, yes, um, our, um, our emergency operation um, center folks had a meeting um, with UT staff and, um, and talked with them about, you know, one, the, our isolation facility is available um, but wanted them to um, develop the contingency to establish that. Um, and so they were going to go back and meet internally, look at um, potential options um, for that, because we don't want to um, overwhelm the asset in the community. And so um, that is something that they are working on. And so they are going to follow up with our emergency operations staff about that. Great. So they are, they are, they have been, they are looking at the contingency of providing an isolation facility for their uh, for their students separate from the city. Yeah, yes, because because the, the goal is is that we don't want to um, overwhelm. Right now, it's fine. Our census, um, you know, has been you know relatively um, low, but we don't want to be in a position where if this if that asset is full then we don't have another more space for other individuals that are outside of the college setting. Yeah, I think that's appropriate. And, and okay. so, I mean, we've seen that at colleges and universities around the country that many of them have made provisions on their campuses, just I assume, not just for the convenience of students and other personnel who might utilize them who are from the university community, but also uh, to, as you said, to avoid overwhelming that city's assets, limited assets in this case. So. Um, thanks very much for those conversations and that work. Thank you. And I will follow up with you about the meals. Thanks. Thank you. That's Member Alter. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, being up to date, updated as well on the food operations for the Pro Lodges. I think that's a really important opportunity for helping out our restaurant sector. Um, and a couple different questions. Um, 
I don't know if this is a question for you, Director Hayden, or for um, Mr. Cronk, but um, I've been hearing some concerns that certain departments are, are really experiencing some staff shortages that are making it difficult for them to carry out um, their work fully um, because folks are out um, taking advantage of the FMLA and, and obviously that's an important benefit and, and we should be providing that. I'm just trying to understand what the impact is on city operations. Um, I have a sense of how many, how many um, staff people we have who are out um, doing the, taking advantage of those COVID operations and what impact that's having on city operations. Uh, Council member, I think I can respond to that. Uh, uh, we ha we are monitoring that closely. Nuria Rivera of Andermind, uh, Deputy City Manager. Um, we are certainly monitoring that. Um, we have frequent meetings with HRD as we look through that, and we uh, certainly want to encourage folks who have that need to avail themselves of the extended FMLA to do so. Um, we have asked departments to let us know periodically where they find um, shortages, and we have been uh, helping to bring in additional resources across the enterprise where that is needed. Um, there are folks um, that have been temps uh, continuing in the enterprise that have been able to be reassigned as the need be. Um, I'll say too that we are uh, being very conservative with our hiring of vacancies or our filling of vacancies as that has moved forward. Um, while we have, we realize that we are in a pandemic and we want to make sure we are monitoring our resources, where departments that are working in the pandemic or in areas that require some assistance, we have certainly been filling those vacancies um, as, as the need and the criticality arises. So we are being mindful, but we can certainly get back to you and the council body about uh, FMLA usage as that moves forward. Thank you. Maybe we can have a, um, a conversation offline, but there are a couple of departments that I'm particularly concerned mm -hmm. about that seem to be impacting um, services that um, are raising other issues and they're not able to um, to meet those needs and when, when, when you have those conversations it's clear they just um, given what they're trying trying to juggle and that's having a big impact um, on some services so if we can have that conversation I would uh, I would appreciate that um, so thank you on that um, my next question I think is for um, Dr. Escott so I wanted to just make sure that I have some clarity on the um, airborne transmission part um, because I don't want there to be confusion out there. And, and as I heard what you said, you said that um, airborne transmission is possible. It's not something that we are seeing as um, having viable virus in some constrained places. So it's possible. Um, but what we really need to worry about is the droplets, and that would mean like if someone coughs on you or if you're touching the droplets. Um, and the best defense for that is wearing the masks and social distancing, staying home when you're sick. Is that correct, Dr. Scott? Yes, ma'am. You got all that correct. Um, and again, I think this this position on uh, the, the contribution of, of airborne transmission is evident by public policy across the world, uh, which is still massively social distancing. Uh, obviously, if, if uh, uh, airborne transmission was a significant factor, uh, it would really prevent us from, from doing things uh, that we normally do without having uh, accelerated uh, growth in, in, the, in the rate of transmission. Uh, that's simply not happening. The, the, the evidence is not suggestive that the airborne transmission plays a significant role. Uh, so those those factors that, that we've uh, discussed all along uh, that you just mentioned are, are critical. Uh, and, and people need to be cautious in those types of settings. A small office with, with a lot of people and, and no ventilation, uh, that transmission could be more efficient in that type of setting. Uh, which is why we continue to recommend that, that separation of people and the masking. And what is the implication of that for the school setting? 
I think the implication is that that teachers and staff uh, shouldn't be overly concerned about about virus floating in the air for hours. Um, I, I think our, our classrooms, our, our schools are generally of sufficient size and have sufficient ventilation uh, to create movement of air, re, uh, recirculation of air uh, that, uh, that, that that method of transmission is, is not going to be significant. Thank you. Um, and then I wanted to just have a better understanding of how, um, how we're watching for those risk factors that the mayor mentioned, like Labor Day and the football game and the return um, to the university. Uh, so primarily we're watching uh, the cases, the new cases, uh, and of course the, uh, the hospitalizations. Uh, we did start to see increases in, in the cases prior to Labor Day. Uh, but it really corresponds with increasing mobility that last week of August. Uh, so people were getting out more. They were interacting more. They were going to restaurants more and, and bars more. Uh, and they were gathering more outside of the household. Uh, so it's not just the holiday uh, and just the special events like the UT game. Generally speaking, people are, have been more relaxed. Uh, so we'll be watching those factors over the next uh, week or two. Uh, to see if there's any significant impact. Again, hopefully, uh, with a, a transmission rate which was low at, at that time period, uh, you know, between the, the 4.7 and 6.1 percent, that we won't see a huge bump. We may see a little bump, but hopefully not a huge one. Thank you. And then, who is who is responsible if there are gatherings that are off campus? That's the city that is responsible and do we have, how are we mobilizing for addressing those gatherings, particularly um, off campus? So the uh, calls for concern regarding gatherings uh, or non-compliance with masking uh, should go to 311. Uh, and uh, Director Hagen can correct me uh, on this, but uh, generally speaking, it's either going to go to code uh, or it's going to go to the fire marshal's office for enforcement, depending upon the venue uh, that's involved. Uh, if it's a restaurant um, or uh, somebody that's a licensed food establishment, that will go to, to Austin Public Health, Environmental Health Services. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Council Member uh, Alter, also worth noting in conversation, you're asking about University of Texas. They have the capacity to test up to 5,000 students a week. They're not getting 5,000 students a week yet to take the tests. They're trying to ramp that up, but there's still a significant number of students that are being tested. Uh, and they get the results from the off-campus testing as well that goes on their dashboard. And the University of Texas has their own dashboard. All the information and data on that are part of what we have on our dashboard, but it is that subset that's available to be seen uh, and I think everybody's taken note of the fact that of the uh, 1,000 students that were tested, because they had to be tested in order to be able to get a ticket to the football game, which is a good practice, and we appreciate the University of Texas doing that. About 100 of them tested positively. I think it was a positivity rate of about 8%. Uh, so we have that information and, and data as well that everybody's looking at. Anything else uh, with these folks, Councilmember Kassar? I know that we're still uh, working up and getting some of the per capita data. Something else that I noted that we haven't seen in a little while since we engaged in some extra efforts was the uh, Spanish speaking versus non Spanish speaking data for the Latino community. And so it'd be great to get an update on that. I remember the last time we checked. Um, with, and with some of the hospitals, it was like a majority of the Latino pa patients were primarily Spanish speakers. But I know we've engaged in, in new work there. And so I think it'd be a good time to check in and, and get that as well with the per cap data that I know is being delivered soon. Okay. Um, anything else? Uh, questions uh, on this? All right, Dr. Um, Hayden, Director, uh, Director Hayden, Dr. Escott, thank you so much. 
I will let you head over to uh, Travis County now. Thank you.